Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. And uh, let's just get the talk started. First, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is CC Huang, and I'm currently working at Google as a software engineer. And uh, I have been contributing directly to Kubernetes upstream for a couple of years and across multiple SIGs. For those who are not familiar with Kubernetes upstream community, SIG is short for um, special uh, interest group. And uh, I started at the SIG Club Writer and won the contributor award there. And then I, I released uh, Kubernetes 127 as the uh, release manager, which is the previous release. And I'm also a contributor in SIG API machinery with the focus on the extensible uh, features. And uh, recently, uh, I'm leading the cell-related work there, and which we are going to talk about a little bit in our next um, slides, maybe. So the topic is declarative everything, and uh, what gonna be covered today? So we'll first begin with the declarative nature of Kubernetes, and uh, uh, <coughs> then talk about the uh, notable missing pieces inside the declarative APIs, and talk about all the improvements we did and plan to do, and then the future plan at the end. So, Let's start with the declared nature of Kubernetes. But first, let's begin with the very basic concept of declarative versus imperative. I know most of you might already be familiar with the concept, but in short words, declarative is when you see what you want, while on imperative is when you see how to get what you want. So let's take a look at an example of a Costco sampling station. I just assume everyone loves the free food there. <laughs> So say we would love to make sure there are always six samples on the tree. And uh, for doing it uh, imperatively, uh, we maybe periodically check the number of the samples on the tree. And if the number doesn't match what we want, we make adjustments. For example, if it's empty, we just make six samples and put them on the tree. If it's more, we just take off the extra. While the declarative way would be to state the desired state, which is um, seven, having like six random samples on the tree. And uh, you can rely on the system to do the right things for you. And you don't need to worry about how the system ensures the desired state to maintain throughout uh, time. So how it can achieve in Kubernetes? You just specify your desired state with a configuration file like this, everyone familiar with YARM. And after submitted to Kubernetes, Kubernetes would perform all the sample monitoring and adjustment for you in a control loop, which we also call it a reconciliation loop. So what's the benefit of this? Um, the biggest thing is that Kubernetes declarative API enforced the separation of responsibilities, so you don't need to spend effort to develop and maintain the implementation. And it's much more intuitive to understand what the end goal is, and it's much easier to change the end goal if you really want. And as everyone knows, all the community magic is done through declarative APIs. So from things like uh, resource allocation to the basic stuff like uh, resource object creation and uh, the authorization. And we even have a declarative API, which is to define new declarative APIs, the customer resource definition. Before we go any further, um, I'd love to um, set the stage. So first, I will not um, get into the backstory of why we went to declarative, like the decision like made um, roughly 10 years ago. There is a fantastic resource I've linked here from the Kubernetes early stage and authored by um, Brian Grant for those curious about the history. And second, we won't be going deep into the inner workings of uh, Control Loop or um, how we, um, all the details about how we do the declarative management. And last, I'm not here to argue about the way over the other. So um, either imperative or declarative communities offers ability for both in di for different use cases, and it always continue to do so. So what are we gonna talk about today? So over time, uh, there has been a lot of effort to make declarative APIs more powerful. Uh, not to mention that the, ver the versionings, the sub resources, the shared structure schemas, the diff 14, the server side apply, the open API v3, and all of those stuff. But <coughs> there are still a bunch of things which we are not able to do them well in declarative API just yet. 
And today, we're going to talk about one of the notable missing pieces, the data validation. So everyone know uh, data validation is critical, and you just need data validation when there are constraints on your data, and it almost uh, constraints everywhere. So however, today, from the declarative APIs, you may easily get information like, um, say for example, your resource uh, might have to have a name, and the name is supposed to be a string. But that's it. It's less obviously to find the constraints behind the fields. So for example, here, uh, even for the, like the, the constraints um, name itself, Kubernetes have so many different uh, um, constraints uh, applied for different names. And if you are defining your own um, customer resources, there might be further. And also, um, type string was widely used uh, um, for all the other fields, and each of them may have like different constraints associated. And uh, it will get even more complicated when you define your own customer resource. And we all know that validating is critical. If, you, if, you, if we don't do validating or don't do it properly, things will break in a hard to reason way. And future um, debugging would be um, much more difficult. So <coughs> here is an example of the current uh, um, open API specification, which gives you exactly what I mentioned, like the, you're supposed to have a name, and the name is supposed to be a string, and that's it. People may argue that, okay, I can write like a very detailed description there, and the user is supposed to like read all through of them and follow them, but everyone knows it's not the, um, what's happening in the real world. So, let's begin with, uh, let's talk about um, how the, the improvement we, do, we did in this area and uh, um, how this is gonna benefit for the, all the users. And let's begin with the one people cares the most, customer resource definition. And uh, there was uh, quite some time that we only have like a very limited support for specified constraints declaratively. So for example, we have CRD structure schemas, we have um, Open API v3 uh, validations, um, so on and so forth as an uh, example here. So we are declaring the um, uh, type and value here for the IP addresses, and we can use some of the, um, we can put some of the constraints in a very declarative way, but that's it. So what if you have like more advanced uh, constraints? Like what if it involves um, check of another field? What if you want to only apply certain constraints uh, when the, um, say the type is set to a specific value? So for quite some time, all the things which are not covered here, we have to use a thing called admission webhook. Anyone here uh, have ever developed their own webhook? Wow, <laughs> not many. Uh, any, of, any of them are familiar with the concept of the webhook? Cool. So the webhook is basically another uh, very powerful extension point um, Kubernetes upstream offering. So it will um, happen like after um, the data being authorized and uh, um, authenticated and before the data was um, served, uh, saved in the persistent uh, storage. But it's a separate like a binary and a component added into your system. So introducing a production grade webhook is not only a um, substantial development work, but also increase the operational complexity dramatically. I'll explain why. But I'll explain it briefly today, but you can get the idea as a separate component added into your system. You just have to, whenever you were trying to introduce a webhook, you just have to think carefully on things like how to package it, how to release it, how to integrate with your existing monitoring or alerting system, and how to upgrade it or roll it back if needed. What about the latency it added? How to scale it? And to make it even worse, webhook is very easy to be misconfigured. So um, a example I always like to give is the failure policy you have to set in your webhook. So basically, webhook allow you to set either fill open or fill close mode. 
by setting the policies inside your configuration. So, <coughs> sorry. If you go with fill open, so it basically means if the webhook fails, either the binary stop serving or there is an error happened, and uh, you just uh, um, gonna let the um, you just gonna let the uh, request through anyway. And if your webhook is doing some kind of security check, that clearly will be a problem. But on the other hand, if you choose to fill close, which means if the webhook has a problem, all the requests that are routed to the webhook will be rejected. So if your webhook matches to all the ports or all the deployments, so you basically lose your control plane availability for that. So that's why still now webhook is still remain the leading cause of the control plane outage. Even people learned uh, over time like to be more cautious to configure it, but it's still having a lot of issues. And for a while, webhook is the only solution to the functionalities we want. And as everyone know, like whenever you bring up your um, CRD, especially like uh, the customer resource is the one you define, so you have to be the one who is responsible um, to validate it. And uh, webhook is widely used for that purpose, but it's causing all the trouble we just mentioned. <coughs> and uh, we began to, as a, uh, as a community maintainer, we began to think about how we could do here to help things better. So after research, we found that the vast majority of the use cases people want to do with validation are really simple. So they want to make sure the field is immutable, or they want to do some basic cross-field check, or they want to apply a specific format to a field. So then the question becomes, can we use something simpler? And I'm really happy and excited to announce that all of that happened through a very magic um, extension field we added into CRD called x-communities-validations. The feature called CRD validation rules, and I linked the documentation here. And I'm happy to announce that like we just graduated to stable in the current Kubernetes 129 release. Of course, if nobody reverted before the formal release date, uh, roughly a month. <laughs> yeah, so what they did is they will leverage a power of a common expression language, which allowed you to write a very, simple, uh, very powerful expressions in your CRD to do your data validation. You don't need to know much about a cell, it's just the tool we used, and after you see the examples following, you can easily guess what they are doing, and you might not even need to look at the documentations like for the um, basic validations you're trying to write. But for sale, all you need to know is it's an open source project and we work really close with the maintainers there. It's designed to be simple and efficient and it's a typed language. So we will do proper type checking for you. And uh, we have already successfully um, embedded um, cell into Kubernetes. So that's great. And cell got pretty solid adoption um, in the Kubernetes ecosystem and other cloud provider offerings. So I will not spend much time there, but just the basic stuff. Uh, all the magic was done through one single extension field called x community validations and it can put anywhere under OpenPI v3 schema if you're familiar with CRD. Um, that gives you a lot of flexibility and you can just start writing um, expressions there. In this example, we want to make sure that the replica we said is always smaller than the max replica being said. So you can use self, uh, which is a cell variable, to provide you access to the values scoped to current schema. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a really nice type checking, which caught the error way ahead of time. So if you have like a, a mistyped field or anything like that, and it will be caught while you um, creating or updating your CRD. And of course, we have another cell variable called old self, which allowed you to be, which allowed it to be used for, we, so we call it a transition rule, but it's mainly just for enforce the immutability. So in this example, we just try to uh, enforce that the field called for is immutable through a very simple cell expression. And uh, my colleague Alexander uh, Zaleski wrote a very nice blog on the use cases on the immutability. So please feel free to take a look if you're interested. 
And here is a real world example. Of, um, I just uh, um, borrowed from um, Gateway API. So as it's showing here previously, we have all those um, basic kind of uh, validation done through OpenPI schema for type and values. But as an example, I just explained earlier, what if we want to apply a specific format for a specific like value if it's been set? Now for those kind of advanced validation, it's all possible with um, the CRD validation rules I just mentioned earlier. So in this case, we want to apply a specific format when the type is set to host name. And uh, I will stop here, but I do have another talk earlier um, this year in another KubeCon to talk about all the details and uh, awesome features offered here. So please feel free to take a look if you're interested. And we have um, great documentation on that. And worth to mention that, thanks to uh, Mathos Maurice, who went ahead and built a uh, called something called Cell Playground, which comes with a lot of examples and allow, allow you to play with Cell. Um, so it's easy to just play with it, make sure all the expressions you, you wrote is right and valid before you actually put it into um, production. And another exciting thing, uh, news I wanted to share is about the adoption. So it's from the um, Gate API, uh, Gateway API team, which just released the GA version. And uh, by using the feature we offered here, they successfully replaced more than 99% of the validation web hook they were used before, which like a great, uh, really um, big relief for them. And thanks to Nick Young and Rob Scott who shared the slides with us. And thanks for everyone who worked on Gateway API to uh, make the adoption working. So now, Wait a second, if we take a step back and look at the CRDs, then that means CRD now is even more declarative than native types, because as many of you may already know that native types doesn't offer the, those many informations. So what is uh, validation done in native types? It's mostly the hard-coded validation logic. You have no idea how many lines of validations just for API sitting inside a Kubernetes um, upstream repo. Um, it's like tens of thousands lines of code only for um, API field validation. It's a lot of maintenance effort, and also it makes it very expensive to add validation later because we're humans and we make mistakes. But as a um, maintainer who like uh, uh, maintain the project like Kubernetes, which is such a fundamental project, has a whole ecosystem like built on top of it. It's, we really don't want to break anything. Like, so um, the, the first principle would be like, uh, we hope that things which previous work will keep working. So which makes it very expensive to add any missing validations later. And also uh, it might cause inconsistent error message in, in different ways because it's all human, uh, um, writing code, so it might have like a, a different error messages, and also because service use a Ghost Direct and the kubectl uses um, Open API schema, so there might be um, inconsistency there as well. So what we are going to do here? There is a um, enhancement re raised recently called the declare validation rules uh, for uh, declare declarative validation for native types. Thanks to my colleague Joe Baz who initiated the effort and thanks for Alexander Zelensky who is leading this effort now. So the main idea behind this is catch the native type with CRD, what we did, what we, uh, I just mentioned in CRD. And so later, like you will be able to use IDL tags to declare validation rules for native types. So an example would be here. There is some IDL, uh, IDL tags people might already familiar with, like minimum, maximum, but um, the field we just mentioned earlier for CRD will also be adopted for native types, which allowed us to write more complicated rules, validation constraints, like uh, um, here, like the um, cross-field check or something. And I have linked the cap um, 
link here. So if you're interested, please take a look. This um, enhancement is going to alpha in the current Kubernetes 129 release, but there is no notable changes for users yet. So we're looking forward for the future work. But the end goal is we plan to support all those IDL tags for native types as well. And all those information will be published to OpenAPI together. And uh, you can see x dash communities dash validation. We're using the exactly same open API validation field for all the complicated and advanced uh, constraints. So what those will bring us? It will benefit for both community maintainers and community users. Um, as an API reviewer who recently um, trying to help with API review, you have no idea how complicated or how many like code sitting there only for like the API validation. And after this, it will be easy to develop, maintain, and review APIs for sure. And it will also will enable the improvements to the API machinery. For example, if we have future like enhancement for the validation parts. Uh, instead of like writing code across like maybe 15k lines of um, handwritten validation logic, you can just embed it, implement it into the um, declarative validation subsystem. And uh, people may ask why I should care if I don't contribute to community um, upstream. Here is the reason. It will allow the direct access to extra API validation rules instead of only checking for descriptions. The end user can now um, very visibly to see that the, all the um, constraints behind the API. And also, this effort will make OpenAPI more val valuable for sure. It will, um, it will for sure tell us more about what's expected. And this effort is also going to allow the shift left validation um, slice com command line uh, to validation to be possible, rely on the information provided by OpenAPI. And uh, in the link, there is already a initiative uh, effort um, done by um, Alex, who is right, uh, who is proposing to have like a uh, um, command line like validation tools for that. And also, it will greatly help the API deposition. So, for example, there is a very common use case that people would want to embed native types into your CRD. And earlier, um, you just have to. Um, you just have to like basically take responsibility for all the validations and uh, in a separate path. But now, after all the constraints are banded together within the um, and published in OpenAPI, it becomes way easier um, to like have like the embedded native types inside the CRD. And uh, it also will gain the validation of native types automatically. So now. Uh, we have talked about specifying um, constraints for CRDs in a declarative way. We have talked about uh, specifying the constraints for native types in a declarative way. But you may wonder, like, if I declare the constraints within the type definition, then the constraints will be forced like wherever I use that type. But what if it's not what I need? So what if I have some kind of constraints which is only, spe is only specified for my own cluster? And for example, for like security reasons, I only want to um, say allow image being pulled from my corporation like uh, registry, or I only allow authorized user to perform a certain um, operation. So in another word, policy enforcement is people is more familiar with. It's used uh, um, generically on security compliance, governance, or configuration management, and previously, um, like e to be able to do it, we only have very limited support uh, together with the community core upstream and people have to use some third party like a policy engine, for example, OPA Gatekeeper or Kavana to, to achieve their goals or you just have to write your own webhook for that. So what we did there is we offered a feature called validating animation policy um, I'm happy to share that we just graduated this feature to beta in Kubernetes 128, which is the last release. And uh, we are working on promoting it to stable in very soon. So what they did is, I will not explain everything, it's maybe too much information, but 
uh, we introduced some new Kubernetes resources called Validating Admission Policy and Validating Admission Policy Binding. And uh, the main reason behind having two resources here is that we would love to um, offer the possibility to properly separate the responsibilities of writing policies and uh, um, the policy enforcement work here. So in this case, the policy would be, very, would be reusable and uh, sufficient configurable to be able to support more than just one company or one cluster. And also like cluster and main who probably will be the one who enforce all those policies. Um, <coughs> sorry. So would have enough flexibility to configure the policy based on the end goal of their own organization. So here is the new resource called validation animation policy. And uh, we, it's very, um, if you are familiar with that hook, um, it might be easy to pick it up. Um, we have like the match constraints, which defined uh, which resources this policy applied to. And the way it works is very similar as the way current uh, webhook works. But uh, we have some more fantastic um, features here as well. And uh, we have like a, a field called validations, which you can just start write cell rules to explain what the policy does. So in this example, um, we just uh, do very simple validations. We want um, the policy applied to all the creation and update deployment requests. And we want to make sure that the replica number set is always um, smaller than a number which were referred to a um, parameter um, resource. You can use basically anything for your parameter resource, which allow, which gives uh, flexibility to cloud admin to like uh, configure the policy. You, so um, then um, cluster admin can go ahead and create something called that intermission policy binding, which bind the policy to your own cluster. And in this case, um, the policy will start to be enforced. And uh, the parameterization will allow the cluster admin to bind like a, uh, multiple policies in different ways. So for example, here, we might want to enforce the, repli the replica to be smaller than three in a test uh, namespace, but for, the, for your production namespace, that might be a different number. And uh, there are so many awesome stuff going on in this feature, but unfortunately, I don't have enough time to talk about it. Um, I talked it a little bit uh, together with the best practice in my earlier talk, to, and we, hopefully the documentation we provided will um, like sufficient answer like the, all the possible questions. And yeah, so. Also, another thing worth to mention that if, you're, if you only want to enforce something very simple, which you don't need parameterization at all, you can just remove the params resource and only, those, only use those two like new resources to achieve your goal. And another thing worth to mention is that the whole ecosystem has been aware of the effort we did and uh, the, the main um, policy engines such as um, OpenGit Keeper or Kvana um, already adopted the feature. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's it. Feel free to talk about more details like afterwards. I'm happy to share. And then let's talk about the future plan and the key takeaways. So the, the, the way um, I view this is like we have like a bunch of use cases uh, we're pretty familiar with like deployments, jobs, RBAX and stuff which are supported by declarative APIs. And we have some other like emerging use cases like we talk about today, the data validation, uh, both for um, native types, for CRDs, for advanced policy purpose, uh, which are not supported by declarative APIs earlier. And we have some further, for example, the mutating cases in policy enforcement area. What about the CRD version conversion and some other use cases which are not covered by declarative APIs. And uh, now, Cell will give us the power to expand the um, power of declarative APIs so that a lot of use cases which were not covered before will be covered now. And we are, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, the mutating case and the uh, CRD conversion is also critical um, since CRD remains one of the most important extension point in Kubernetes um, offerings. So our next step will be expand the declarative API power to include uh, those cases as well. 
and uh, we are uh, work, uh, there is a cell, um, all those work I mentioned has been done under the CKP machinery. Here is the um, contact information, and we also have a specific working group called cell working group, and uh, have like the separate Slack check and mailing list. So please feel free to talk to us if you feel that's usable. Thank you so much, and I'm open for questions. And I guess we have Mac on each side, so if whoever have questions, um, feel free to speak up. Thanks for nice, nice work. Um, after validation, to accomplish your declarative goal, are you gonna do remediation? I, I saw your drawing board, right, the future work. Oh yeah, so uh, mutating would be our next target for sure, because um, there are a lot of use cases, especially among the policy um, uh, enforcement area, where people just wanted to make sure they apply all, like see the labels um, in their resources or whatsoever. So that will be our next step. So can I see, to make declarative API a reality, there are still gaps. Right, mutation is one of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you elaborate any other gaps? Um, for example, like a controller. So even though you like we allowed the power to declare declare your like a new declarative APIs through customer resource definition, but you still have probably to write your own. I don't know, imperative controllers, <laughs> which told them how to do. So I will keep the door open to future possibilities to also say support use cases like that in a more declarative way. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, I got a question on um, sort of validating the, the cell that you've written. Um, like in the replicas field, you know, you had that typo. Like, um, what are sort of tools that you can use for catching errors like that? I mean, like, um, you, know, you, you said that it would have gotten caught, and it, it seems like, you know, there, there are tools like that, but sort of how, how can we validate that actually we're writing, you know, you're adding code, essentially, to the, to the YAML files. Like, uh, you know, how do you validate that code? Oh, that's a great question. So as I mentioned, Cell is a type check, typed language, so we properly do the type checking for you in all of the uh, features I mentioned. So for example, in the CRD, um, um, if um, the good thing about the type checking is that we do it uh, in a really early stage of the life cycle. So whenever you have like a um, C type checking error there, so you misspelled a field name, for example, it will be caught immediately when you try to apply your um, customer resource definition. So, and also you can use either like uh, the cell playground I shared to pre-verify, or you can make your own like cell linter, um, like tools to pre-verify before you really apply your CRD. And we do have some um, cell linter um, tools available, but currently it's lack of maintenance. So feel free to make your own or come to <laughs> contribute. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, the current uh, validating uh, web admissions webhook ecosystem is pretty large. Basically every project has one multiple tons. Um, do you see this uh, less, like significantly lessening the amount of charts that are shipping with uh, full validating webhooks, or is it more of a different yeah, we, set? Yeah, we agree that's a huge area out there. And, uh, um, and uh, as I mentioned, like we do see a lot of troubles like webhook was bring to us. Um, like not only the, the, the things I mentioned, but also like it's, it's a lot more complicated configuration and it's a separate component, it's a separate binary, so it involves a lot of extra effort there. So what we did here is we were trying to really focus on the um, Kubernetes upstream offerings, try to think what we should do to make this extension point better. So. Um, after the validation admission policy were widely used, it can also be used by um, among the main like policy and uh, policy like engines, like I mentioned earlier, or like among other kind of third party uh, policy engine um, tools, so that they could leverage the power of this um, 
to kind of reduce the trouble previously made by webhook. Yeah. I hope that answered. Yeah, that does. I have one more if no one else has one. Sure. Um, and I might have missed this earlier. Uh, are there any plans to extend this to mutating policies? Oh, yes. Um, our next plan would be like expand the power to mutating use cases for sure. And uh, hopefully we could get something like wrapped up for the next release. Yeah, we're working on the design. And because um, mutating, of course, obviously, are more, way more complicated than validating cases. And uh, we discussed earlier um, inside the SIG API machinery. So um, all the like, key uh, maintainers there agree that we should like, wait until we finalize the validation cases before we move um, too soon to uh, mutating cases. Yeah. That seems like a pretty huge deal for versioning, primarily. Um, if you have minor bumps within your versions, you no longer need any webhook at all. Um, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, hopefully. That's our end goal. Thank you. <laughs> to save people from the webhook nightmare. Oh, sorry. The time end. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah.